Hi, um, thank you for joining us. We have did the um, webinars and thanks for everyone who joined us on those webinars. They were a huge success and we got great feedback. So thank you, everyone. Um, we wanted to release our um, pathway and there's been a few questions and feedback. So that's great. And we also um, wanted to get through the questions that we didn't manage to get through on the, on the webinars. So I'm really pleased that tonight we've been joined by some real experts in cord Aquinas syndrome um, to go through those last few questions and then hopefully finalise everything as far as the, the flowchart's concerned. Um, so I'd like to introduce the panel who are with us tonight. Um, firstly is Mr John Leach, who is a consultant neuros um, spinal neurosurgeon at Salford Royal. Um, and the outgoing uh, Regional Spinal Network Chair, um, who's going to give us a surgical perspective. So uh, welcome, Mr Leach. Um, Chris Mercer, who you all know from the webinars, who's consultant physio um, and expert in quadriquina syndrome, along with Sue green Alsh, who, again, you all met on the um, webinars. We've asked Laura Finuka to enjoy, join us today, who is the president of the International Federation of Musculoskeletal Physical Therapy, if I've got that right, Laura, um, and also a, a, an expert in quadriquina syndrome and has published the most latest um, systematic reviews in this area. Um, so we wanted to join her knowledge to, to, the, um, to the group. And um, not with us quite yet, but will be joining us as part of the webinar is Carol Gavin, who is a consultant in emergency medicine and the vice president of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Um, from the National Back Pain Clinical Network, we have Elaine Buchanan, um, Dermot Ferguson, Michael Reddington and um, Jim Greenoff, sorry. Um, Lost, lost that then, um, who were all with us last time. So hopefully you should know um, all consultant physios and work as part of the back pain clinical network. So I think we'll, we'll go straight in with the first couple of questions because there's a few um, surgical ones that we were going to pose to to Mr. Leach and a few on imaging as well. Um, so the, the one that's been asked a few times and is, is a generalised question, Mr. Leach, is um, around when you get a scan that you've ordered in primary care and it comes back and the report suggests that there's crowding of the cord equina. Um, what does the, would you expect the clinician to do? Do they need to send those patients straight to the emergency department? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I've read all the questions and I thought they were absolutely brilliant. I have to say as a, as a starting point, they're all very relevant to what we do in spinal surgery and the, the decisions we have to make on call. Um, the issue of a scan report or findings and how that relates to the patient is really critical. And of course, the most important thing is the patient, their symptoms and signs. So that's number, number one. Um, the scan findings are obviously irrelevant without that. Um, I would say that for alarming scan findings, but a well patient, there's probably two groups. One is the patient that has chronic stenosis and that can be quite commonly asymptomatic and that will be caused by possibly a minor central disc bulge but predominantly facet joint arthritis bulging ligaments it's a build up over years so in that condition of chronic stenosis you'll find a, a decent msk and neuroradiologist will never write corda equina compression uh, or, or, or mention the corda equina they'll always call it stenosis which may be mild moderate or severe but not uncommonly unfortunately we are finding some radiologists will call it corda equina compression or compression of the thecal sac um, and sometimes that that is inappropriate because it does set alarm bells going um, so in that in that circumstance I would say it, there's not an urgent problem uh, if the patient doesn't have relevant symptoms and signs now if a patient does have, say, bilateral leg pain and they have um, significant stenosis, then that's not an urgent condition. But there are, diff there are some cases where there's a very large acute disc prolapse and it's actually a disc prolapse, not chronic stenosis that's causing the problem. And if they have bilateral leg pain, that is a concern. And... The way I answer that is I look at the scan in detail and make my mind up on whether it is a chronic stenosis or whether it's an acute disc. And I can imagine that 
in the setting that the um you know our attendees are in that's actually quite difficult you might not have the scan available to you um so i, I can't answer uh, you, that question for every patient but i would definitely say if it says severe stenosis it's normal to have bilateral leg pain and that's elective um, if it's a large central disc prolapse um, and they have true bilateral sciatica, I think that is an urgent problem. That is quite rare, but um, I hope that helps explain the problem. I think sometimes the radiology reports are not helpful. I think that's great. And I think you've answered about three questions in one there. So that's that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to move on to Chris for the next one. because there's a few questions that were directed specifically to, to Chris. Um, the first one is, is with greater public awareness and promotion of um, CES, do you think that there's a risk that we're promoting functional neurological disorders that, that mirror the signs and symptoms of Caudriquina syndrome? Um, and I would have put that out to the panel, but it was specifically directed to you, Chris, so I'm sorry. So yeah, I was just saying, Michelle, that's a really tough question to, to start with. I was looking at the other questions and I thought I'd much prefer to start with those. But I think I think in terms of, yeah, you know, are we storing up problems for later and um, building up an epidemic of functional cord requina disease? I don't think that's the case. I think we know there are some patients who um, present with more widespread chronic pain type presentations uh, and cord requina signs and symptoms are part of that. But I don't think we can um, avoid raising awareness of cord requina as a serious issue to to deal with that small number of patients i don't think we can we can afford to be complacent uh, i think we have to be mindful and we have to be careful uh, in our examination of the patient and then we have to make a decision and weigh up the odds uh, i think we're looking for you know significant recent changes we're taking it as part of a whole history uh, but i think if we're in doubt then, then we're kind of duty bound to, to scan these patients. And if that means we do scan some patients um, that perhaps uh, have functional disorders, then yeah, we will continue to see these patients coming back in. And then we have to make a decision each time we see those patients. So I think it would be far too easy to consign patients to being to having functional disorders. Uh, rather than doing due diligence by them. So I think we just have to take each case as it comes each time they present. That's great. Thanks. I think it fits in with, with Mr. Leach's um, assessing the patient as well. And, and, and you're all saying the same things already, which is which is great. Um, yep. Okay. Well, the, the, I guess we can move on from that to a little bit around safety netting. And there's a few people. I, I was going to move on to you, um, Sue, with that fantastic video that you've released this week. Um, around safety netting, quite a few people have asked, it is, do we have to tell every patient of the red flags of quadriquina syndrome that comes to us with back pain? Or is, is there certain patients that you would um, safety net and others that, that you wouldn't? So in general, it's going back to what we've just said, Michelle, it's keeping the patient in the centre of this and understanding the condition. And like Chris said, is this a progressing condition? So have they got progressing back pain? Now it's in the leg. Uh, and you can see you're working on your differential diagnosis and looking at your applied anatomy that something potentially is getting worse here and bigger. Um, those are the people that you would safety net. Every back pain that comes in, you wouldn't be giving them a quadriquina card, for instance. It would have to fit in with, with their signs and symptoms because, as we've said before, patients know their symptoms hour by hour. And we need to work with patients as partners to get them to the right place at the right time. Not worrying those who kind of don't fit into that at risk category. So, so you do choose who to safety net about Cordiaquina syndrome by using your clinical reasoning, keeping the patient in the center, but making sure they understand exactly what you've said, that they uh, you know, can actually reason back to you what they need to do uh, and if what symptoms occur. 
that's great. There's a there's a few more on safety net, and I don't know whether it's worth um, you coming in on on this one, Laura. Um, and it, it kind of fits a little bit with the with the question to Chris around whether we can instill fear in people by giving them too much information, or, or is it that we need to be in, informing these people? And, and and if we do it well, that with, there's no danger of that. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's a great question as well, really. I think um, there's often, we get queries from, from clinicians saying, I really don't want to worry these patients. You know, if I tell them these things, they're going to worry about it. And I, you know, I think we would, we would kind of disagree with that. I think if it's done in the right way with enough information and they're very clear about what they need to do in terms of, you know, if they develop these things, they know, you know, what the time frame might be, what they need to look out for, and how to act on it, then I think, you know, that that shouldn't worry them. And in, in, in fact, our experience is that they actually feel quite um, supported and empowered, really, to, mm -hmm. to, to then act on it. So they're part of that collaboration, essentially, I think. So, you know, if it's done well, and the context is wrapped around it, then it really shouldn't be shouldn't be an issue in my mind. That's great. And that there's a few people on talking about virtual consultations and safety netting virtually. Um, and like I say, we'll, we'll put a link on this to, to Sue's video that's, that's fantastic for patients. Um, or I, I, all of you, I apologise if, if you're all involved. Um, but is there is there anything that you would do differently from a safety netting perspective on the telephone? So I, I would say <clears throat> not really. I think, I think, you know, for us, we know that, you know, the challenges are with all of these things that's around communication. So we know that if you're doing it on the telephone, then your communication has got to be so much better. We know that. And it's about picking up on those nuances that you won't see necessarily with, with patients. If you can't see them, then we don't always see the, the facial expressions or their pauses and, and just, we don't always pick up on that. So I think it's really about exploring some of the, some of those really important questions we need to ask them. Um, and, and, you know, it's in, in terms of safety netting, it, again, I would, you know, the, the key thing is that these, the, the information is documented. We're clear about what we're communicating with them. They're clear about what their, what their role is in all of this, but also backing that up with sending them some information through the post or, you know, in this digital age, you know, I can, I can click a button and that goes to their phone with the information. So I think, you know, it, in some ways it, it's slightly easier or could be. I agree. And I, th I think moving, there's there's a, quite a few questions around the virtual working. Um, and while we're on that, I'd like to just welcome, Carol was 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 not here at the start, but Carol Gavin, who's the Vice President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine consultant, um, A&E consultant. I, I think I'm, I'm going to send this one your way, if that's OK. Um, there's a few people said that while they're working virtually, they are doing telephone consultations. Um, and should they, if they suspect cord requirements, <laughs> subject, subject, subject. And then um, should they be sending people to A&E without bringing them in themselves and examining them? Um, OK, I'm going to come back, Mr Leach, to you if that's OK. I feel like you're the nominated radiologist in all of this. Um, but the, there is an interesting question um, for, uh, that, that came through, um, which is, can we be confident enough that MR scans are sensitive enough to pick up cord requirement? Well, they've put syndrome, but I'm guessing they mean compression. I think that's relatively easy to answer, Michelle, because um, you can be confident that the MRI is going to pick up cord equina compression. Uh, there's no need to worry about that. Um, if I might just go on and, and again answer one of the other questions while we're talking on this subject, uh, the scan gives you reassurance if you scan the right part of the body. Uh, and if there is a very good question about whether you should scan the rest of the spine and that speaks to whether you are confident that your symptoms and signs locate to lumbosacral nerve roots and not to spinal cord. And if there is a doubt, you need to, to scan the spinal cord as well. So we're back to clinical examination, aren't we? And I think um, there's a few questions come in as well around whether we should, if, if, if there's somebody with urinary dysfunction, whether we should be thinking about scanning the pelvis that may possibly be over to the msk guys rather from than your side maybe um sue or, or chris do you what, what are your thoughts on that so what i was going to say is it, um it depends on your clinical reasoning so 
first of all, you must have a clear reason why you're scanning the lumbar spine. You're suspecting Cordyquina syndrome, you think it's coming from the lumbar spine. If that's negative and the clinical reasoning suggests that there is something that's causing compression, maybe you've got neurological deficit in line with alongside the Cordyquina syndrome symptoms, then you may need to look somewhere else and then you need to reason where that might be. So it depends on the specific person, their history, what they're telling you, their signs and symptoms, whether you might need to go higher, as uh, Mr. Leach has said, or whether you need to go into the pelvis. So it's kind of that, that complete clinical reasoning that's really important. I know uh, I've seen some of the questions that said, should you keep going until you find something? You've got to have a good reason for investigating and for looking at further imaging. And, and uh, you know, you've got to reason why you're looking at that particular area and what might you be looking for. So it's kind of not just a shot in the dark of, well, I'll have a look there then. I don't know if that helps. The other, the other thing, Michelle, is it's really important that people recognise when it's something that they're not familiar with and seek advice from other clinicians who may be more knowledgeable in that field. So I think that threshold of it's not showing up in the lumbar spine, it's not got upper motor neuron signs, you're concerned about something in the pelvis, it's sometimes out with your scope of experience and just go and get advice. And I think that that's but there's a few questions on that, Elaine, that's really helpful because it, the, there's a few people talking about women's health, um, physios from a, the physio world, but also um, I guess you could put obstetrics around, around that area. And should we as MSK practitioners be looking to people like that to help support us in all of this muddy in the water? Absolutely. Yeah. I know a lot about spines, but I don't know lots about women's health. I'm not an expert in women's health. I'm not an expert in pelvic pathology, but I know a lot about my subject. And I, I think that it's important to recognise sometimes other people know more than what you do. So we, we've talked a little lot about the patients as they're coming and the, the first examination, and we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the pathway um, quite soon. But there is there is a few examination questions now. We're on that looking at we talked about upper motor neuron testing and, and, and there's a few people asking about bladder scans. Um, and I guess probably I'm, I'm coming back looking your way, Mr. Leach. Um, is this something that people should be doing in primary care as part of their diagnostic workup? Okay, um, there's a good question about bladder scans and it does open up a can of worms. Um, what we know is there isn't a good clinical or adjunctive test for ruling out cord equinus syndrome other than an MRI scan. And we're very poor at telling which patients will have a positive scan and which patients will have a negative scan. My personal view is because the bladder scan produces a number, we like numbers, people then try and use a bladder scan result as a surrogate marker of whether there's cord equina syndrome or not. And I think it's a potentially dangerous tool in that regard. Um, if someone um, is emptying their bladder well, they can still have cord equina syndrome, but they haven't got retention yet. I think if you have a grossly abnormal bladder scan, it should be obvious clinically that the patient's not emptying their bladder. So um, my view in primary care is I wouldn't worry too much about bladder scans. I think it's more of a secondary care uh, tool that we use, but it is not a surrogate for an MRI scan and the pathway should not be delayed waiting for a bladder scan or uh, the bladder scan results can also be quite inaccurate when they're repeated and between different users. It's a personal view. I don't know what the rest of the panel feel. I think, uh, and that's probably the reason that it, Elaine didn't, it, you know, it's included in the, in the pathway. Um, but I guess that those, those out in primary care, do you have anything to add on that? Michelle, I would completely, completely agree. I think we, we should be in primary and community care, we should be stepping away from that. It's not particularly helpful. I completely agree. You know, people want this definitive answer about 
you know makes it very black and white and we know it's not black and white so you know it's not helpful for us to even be you know, considering that that's going to help us along you know to make those decisions so i completely agree with that stay away yeah i would say the same as well um michelle I'd, i would i think there is a temptation and it, the bladder scan is being used as a uh, as a surrogate as mr leach says and it's also being used as a barrier um actually you know there might be some sense in using it as a helpful prioritization tool for people uh, to get them into the mri scanner but we have to you know, recognize the MRI scan is a definitive investigation uh, and use that uh, rather than the bladder scan as, as a de facto um, or replacement um, diagnostic tool. I think I would add, Michelle, um, just as Mr. Leach said, that people can have Cordyquina syndrome uh, and have a normal bladder scan. So the important thing in primary care is the really good subjective history. So if they've got the information in the subjective history to suspect Cordyquina syndrome, whether if they did a bladder scan, um, whether it was normal or not, wouldn't affect them referring on in a timely manner. So, you know, I think that that subjective history is much more important and, uh, and where the concentration needs to be. There's a few more questions about examination findings while while we're there. I know we've gone straight for, for the bladder scanner just because that came up perhaps more than others. Um, but there's a few questions uh, touching on sensa sensation and perianal sensation testing. Um, I think they were specifically directed to you, Chris. Um, but I, I'm, again, anyone I'm happy to, to answer. Um, talking about if, if there's any national competencies for, for testing perianal sensation mm. and, and PR. Um, and, and we talked a bit about the patient, potentially whether they can check that area themselves. And they, they, there's a few people asked if you could go through that in more detail, Chris. Yep. Um, the, the, the answer to the first part is no, there aren't any national competencies. And I don't think necessarily there are there is a need for it. I think I was probably mis misleading on the on the webinar. And I, I'd, um, I'd said that we had used some POG guidance. Um, to steer how we were testing uh, anal tone and saddle sensation testing in our department. So that had come from our POG, our women's health team. Uh, I'd assume they got it from the POG uh, national group and they hadn't. They'd put together some sensible advice themselves, which we'd used. So I, I don't think there there is any national guidance. However, I'm not sure there needs to be. You know, the actual saddle sensation testing is a pretty straightforward process. You know, as physios, we're good at testing sensation and we should be able to do pinprick and light touch sensation very easily. You just have to know where the saddle is. So I think, you know, I've, I've had lots of correspondence since the, since the webinar around this. And, and what I've suggested to people is look, that the actual process is very easy. If you want to standardise how you do that uh, within your department, that will be sensible so that you have a process that people are very clear about um, how you consent the patient, how you set it up for the patient, how you explain why you're doing what you're doing, and then the process of doing it, uh, the process of having a chaperone, of documenting the chaperone, uh, chaperone's name and documenting in the notes what you've done. So I think more about the kind of uh, legal process, if you like, or the actual doing process, having some sort of pro forma to suit your department would be sensible. But I think the actual testing itself is is um, is very straightforward. Um, in terms of the patient testing themselves, I think certainly with the virtual consultations, that's there as an option. And I think that's where it came up, either in in the setting where the patient doesn't want you, or won't consent to you doing the examination, but may consent to doing it themselves. So that might be for a whole host of reasons. It might be that you know, they've had previous bad experiences. It might be a cultural uh, issue. It might just be that they don't want you to do it and uh, so if you're face to face with a patient and they don't want you to um, test their, their sensation then you can you can get them to test their light touch uh, around their genitals and back passage and you can either do that um, you know, from the outside through their clothes or you get them to behind the curtain and they can do you know skin to skin touching so whichever works for for the patient in that setting so again you know, it's about making sure you've got a process you're very clear as, as to why you want them to test it uh, you're very clear about what you're asking and very clear about the consequences 
Uh, so I, I think uh, you know, from, and from a virtual consultation, that again is quite a, uh, it, it's very important that you have that process and you're very clear about the setup for the patient um, as, with, as with the other questions we'd ask. But it can be, I think it's just a useful addition. You know, we know that this is primarily a subjective diagnosis, but if we're asking, you know, it's a quick and easy test that may add more information. And we know from, from some of the work that you've done, Michelle, that um, you know, there may be a correlation with positive scans for these patients with altered sensation. So actually it may be a useful part of, of getting the patient through the system a bit quicker. So, so I, I would advocate that we try to do this with 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 most patients. Uh, I, I don't know what Laura and Sue and Mr Leach think, but I think that would be a sensible way forward. Uh, so I think we, um, when we did the could, the qualitative study for the core that led to the core decliner cards, one of the one of the items that patients with core decliner syndrome said that they didn't realise was that when they wiped themselves after toileting that it was numb. They didn't realise that was an important issue. So you know that that is kind of a self test that is on the core decliner syndrome cards now. That is something that core decliner patients pointed out. So that's kind of a, a, a self test. Um, so yeah, that is worth certainly worth asking. Yep. Um, there's a few questions while we're on the the around that area. A few people are asking about anal tone, and I know that on the pathway, Elaine, there was a decision that that in primary care it's not a, a necessary um, test, but people still seem to be asking if that's something that that should be done, and and does that if somebody had normal perianal sensation but uh, reduced anal tone, would would that would you be acting on that? So the thing with anal tone is that we first of all don't really know what normal tone is. So it's quite difficult to determine what abnormal tone is, especially in patients when they're a bit older. What's a more helpful thing is an anal squeeze. The issue for where it sits on the pathway and where it should be tested is really about the fact that it's a late sign. So when people develop changes to anal tone or they can't squeeze around your finger, it tends to be a late sign and you would expect to see other features as well. So we're not necessarily thinking that the only feature of called Aquinas syndrome would be reduced anal tone. Um, so I think that I would focus much more on the other signs and symptoms. And I would agree with the others that saddle sensation is a far more sensitive test and the, we, we think that the saddle sensory changes happen early in the, in the presentation. And it does change whether, um, you know, a person needs to go to an emergency department or not. So, you know, absolutely, yes, for saddle sensation. But in primary care, we don't think anal tone is helpful because it doesn't change the decision to refer um, to a and &E. So it's not necessarily needing done there, but it should be done at the point of entry to secondary care. There's a, a few people asked, Mr Leach, that if, if uh, are you going to want to repeat that in every patient before you operate if they've, if they've got cordoquina compression on a scan? Okay, so my practice is clearly skewed towards the patients with positive scans. So I see patients with established corda equina syndrome on a daily basis almost and i'd just like to echo what elaine said i've never seen and i've never heard of a patient with isolated re redu reduced anal tone and no other obvious features of corda equina it's a late sign and patients with significant bowel dysfunction tend to have a pretty full house of perineal numbness bladder dysfunction with retention and, and then reduce anal tone. That's, so that's the first thing I completely agree. As an isolated finding, it's not that useful. It also, there's no uh, quantification of anal tone. Just last week I was on call and got told that a lady aged 88 had reduced anal tone. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, you can very rarely get corda equina in an elderly age group, but anal tone, what's normal? Come on, you know, it's, it's not a useful thing to do. Um, I don't have any problem with primary care physicians um, documenting the presence or absence of anal tone in their view, but as an isolated finding, it's not useful. 
Um, in terms of what we do, we don't use it as a, we don't use anal tone in secondary care as a marker of the severity of the quarter equina syndrome. We're very privileged. We get the scan. They either have it or they don't because the scan's very sensitive. That's great. Thanks. And so I think this has drawn a line under that, that, that um, worry that a lot of physios have about, about doing the testing of, of anal tone. So um, thanks to the committee for that. Um, while we're sort of in that area, the last the last one around that area, and while while I'm looking at you, Mr. Leach, um, people, uh, there's one person asked about a priapism and whether that that's an associated symptom. So um, you can get variable features of lower sacral nerve root dysfunction. Um, priapism classically is a, a sign of, um, you know, a spinal cord injury, most typically a severe spinal cord injury. It's not uncommon to get priapism, um, but I have rarely seen it uh, in cord equina syndrome and I've seen it in some legal cases. So it, it clearly is possible, but it's not a normal finding. The normal male genital findings would, would be, you know, penile numbness and impotence, inability to gain an erection. Um, but I, I have seen it documented rarely. Uh, I don't quite understand the pathophysiology, but that can happen. Yes. That's great. OK, the, one more question on um, examination findings, really, That and, and I'm, I'm not sure who from the panel wants to answer this. I, I'll let you, you go for it. Um, about ankle reflexes and um, somebody asking if... if Bilateral ankle reflex um, ab absenteeism, um, would that raise suspicion of cord equina or an incomplete cord equina compression? Who's that to, Michelle? I didn't really know. Uh, I'm happy to answer it, but I think, it, I mean, I, I'm sure everyone on the panel will agree, you know, uh, reflex findings in isolation, again, aren't very relevant. Um, why don't I let the physios on the panel answer it because I'm sure I'll agree. Anyone want to take that on? Well I, I would say Michelle it depends on lots of things just like Mr Leach said I mean the age of the patient in isolation with no equina syndrome symptoms it, it wouldn't really worry me it's like you need to take the whole picture together you know in the older age you might have no ankle reflexes and that's completely normal and um, so you know it's kind of um, not within the, the bigger picture of the cord equina problem that we're looking for. However, further neurological um, findings that suggest there is neurological deficit, um, looking at a whole myotome, dermatome reflex picture that fits in with progressing neurology is much more important. Yeah, I think that point about if it's progressive, so it would, is, is important, isn't it? You know, if you've yeah. seen them if you're seeing the patient you know, consecutive weeks or whatever and things are changing, then that might be something that you put in terms of would it on its own you know, signify cord requirement. I would absolutely agree we wouldn't be yeah. concerned about that, but yeah. could be part, could be part of a progressive deterioration in their neurology. Yeah, it's that, that thing of isola in isolation. It, it doesn't help. I mean, I think yeah. in a surgical practice, the reflexes are useful for me in, in two ways. One is where the distribution of pain isn't barn door for which nerve root it is. If you have an asymmetrical reflex finding with a reduced reflex where there's pain, that will help you get the right nerve root. Um, but you know that's that's a clinical interest thing. The MRI will tell you the final answer, so that that can be useful in that regard. And the other thing is um, if they're very exaggerated reflexes, obviously that will be a potential pointer to cord pathology and should stimulate you to think about the upper limbs and examining the upper limbs as well and questioning about cord symptoms. But of course, um, young women in particular, but anyone can have physiological, very brisk reflexes. So it doesn't always mean there is pathology. They're the two ways I think I would find reflex findings useful when I have what I think is a lumbar spine pathology in front of me. That's great. I think it's coming across loud and clear from all of you that a, a good clinical assessment is vital um, and, and using your clinical reasoning skills. So so that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to move on slightly more to the, the pathway now. So I'm looking more at the um, exec committee of the uh, National Back Pain Clinical Network. Um, 
and there's, there's a few questions specific to the pathway. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll start with um, Elaine, if, if you want to jump in um, to begin with. Um, there's a few people asking about timeframes and what we mean by urgent and, and non-urgent. And I guess this will answer the question potentially about older people with, with, with slow stenotic type symptoms. Um, so can you clarify what we mean by urgent and, and non-urgent within the pathway? So firstly, just to say that I think the questions related to urgent really initially were about the urgent MRI and those, that was related to earlier drafts of the document. So the final draft of the document, the only, rel the only time that we talk about urgent is in the box on the second page that's saying that if someone has bilateral leg pain and they've got myotomal weakness, um, but otherwise no features of quadriquina syndrome, that we recommend urgent referral. And we changed it from urgent MRI to urgent referral because there are so many different pathways out there in the country that it's not always about referring someone for an MRI. It's about ensuring that they move further down the pathway. Now, all of the um, areas in England in particular will have regional spinal networks and your regional spinal network should have an agreed pathway for emergency cases for quadriquina syndrome. And there's probably an urgent pathway being agreed as well. If your regional spinal network doesn't have one, then there should be a local one in place. But um, the first thing I would do is find out what the emergency pathway is and what your urgent pathway is at local level. Our framework is really to help shape what pathways would look like, but it needs to be tailored to your local environment and, and make that work. But this is where we would like the, um, the people within the regional spinal networks and the national back pain clinical networks at regional level to be linking together to get these pathways working. That's great, thank you. Um, th there's a few questions from the pathway perspective around um, a cutoff time. It, it, in terms of uh, symptoms, if, if somebody's had them for a certain cut length of time, is, is there any one point where we do or don't worry? So um, what we say is that there's a, in terms of duration of symptoms, there's just one factor that you need to be taking account of. But the thing that we're most interested in is the progression of symptoms. So, you know, if someone's had symptoms for four weeks and they're very stable, we might be more confident that that is not an acute quadriquina syndrome that needs surgery that night or within the next few hours. Um, so someone with a stable presentation, it might be they need an urgent referral and they would be managed um, as soon as possible. We would often look at having them operated on the next available list. But someone who's got a four week history or a six week history, but their presentation is deteriorating is a different story. And that's why it's not safe to just put a simple timeline on things. You've got to look at the, the presentation and whether it's actually changing and it's changes to the presentation, even in a patient who's had symptoms for three months, you know, but it's clearly deteriorating. That's something that you would still use the emergency pathway for. That's great. And then um, an interesting one, I think, mm -hmm. if, if somebody, we talked earlier, and I missed this one at, at that point, regarding safety netting, um, if someone hasn't had the safety netting information because they just had mechanical back pain um, and then they develop quadriquina syndrome. I don't know if this, if you want me to fire this one to, to Laura or Sue, um, if they then did go on to develop quadriquina syndrome, where do we, that does that clinician stand medico-legally? Well, if, I mean, I'm not a legal expert, but if this, if we went to see the physio and they had mechanical back pain and the examination subjective and objective was well if objective is able to be done at that time was well documented and uh, you know the appropriate evidence-based approach fitting in with the national guidelines were, was carried out then that's appropriate at that time you know it's kind of taking things uh, in the context of how the patient presents 
So I'm assuming at that time, as they present, they haven't got any leg symptoms, it's not rapidly progressing, and they do just present as a simple mechanical back pain, then treating it as, as the guidelines suggest is the best evidence and that's what they should do. Um, you know, kind of, it could have been months and months and months down the line. It's, you know, you've got to take the patient in the clinical setting as you find them. And it's kind of, we, we need to not be behaving too litigiously to save our back. We've got to be looking after the patient, being sensible, doing all of the right things, but documenting properly, looking after the patient's safety net and those who are appropriate. But, you, you know, the pathway is there to help. Okay, that's great. Um, I think most of the other, we've covered a lot there. There's a lot of things that, that we covered on the night as well. So I think we have got to, to the bottom of most things. But some interesting ones that, that are on the framework, but also um, around research and, um, and development. Now, Michael Redson is our research lead from the National Back Pain Clinical Network. Um, so, Michael, if, if it's OK, I'm going to fire some of these your way from a, a research perspective. Um, the first one, and I'd, I'd like Laura's input as well on this, is why why do you think that the UK is leading on research for around quadri equina syndrome compared to other countries? Uh, thanks, Michelle. Uh, I think there's several reasons for that. I think we're we're always aware as clinicians and clinical academics that quadri equina syndrome is devastating if it occurs to you and your patients and their families, and so. I think we have first-hand experience of seeing these patients and the devastating consequences of missing. The elephant in the room is, of course, litigation and the personal, the, the, the personal toll that that takes on you if you've missed a potential core requiner. So I think we're always belt and braces and very aware of, uh, of the signs and symptoms. I also think our, our research setup in the country is, is improving certainly with networks such as ours, um, links with universities and opportunities for funding for research. Um, and I think probably finally, the, um, the, the lack of clear guidance, which you know, our framework adds to significantly, but a lack of clear guidance and agreement between clinicians um, also, um, also pushes and, and encourages research. I don't know what you think, Laura. Uh, yeah, I agree with all of that, really. I think, um, and in some ways, I think partly it's in part to do with where we where we function as as clinicians. So <clears throat> we probably see a lot of cord equina, well, a lot of potential cord equina uh, patients because of where we sit within the pathway. You know, we've developed some roles that, you know, were traditionally done by the medics. Um, so we're sitting in all of those areas where we, we are going to see them, pick them up. And, you know, Sue and Chris and I have worked really closely together over the years. And, and our focus has been about early identification because we know how important that is to get these patients absolutely seen really quickly in that pathway. So, yeah, I completely agree with what you said. Can I come in as well? Just, just to kind of, I suppose, build on that. I think our, I think one of the reasons we are pushing is, is around our scope of practice. And Laura's kind of talked about that, that there in terms of scope of practice in this country from a physio point of view we are leading the world so i think we're also you know leading the world in worry around cord requiner so I, I think you know we as, as physios we put ourselves in those positions which is great you know to support the system but also we're then you know recognizing that there are some issues in primary care that that we want some answers to so there is a lot of work you know we're helping to push that along i think as well The other important thing is that um, there's many of our members uh, work in a secondary care environment and we were very aware that BAS has produced guidance for the secondary care management of Caldraquina syndrome. And the whole reason that this framework evolved was because there is no guidance out there in primary care for how suspected Caldraquina syndrome should be identified and managed. And that's why this framework was actually put together, really to try and help all of the people who are working in an environment where guidance didn't exist. 
That's great. And um, I think I might put you on the spot here now, Michael. And uh, what do you think about the National Back Pain Clinical Network looking at, at a database for, for potential um, chronic quinine syndrome patients within primary care? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be a nice idea. But I think a lot from a surgical point of view, surgeons that I work for, we use the, the British um, Spinal Registry and a lot of the, the surgery is caught on that. And I know from um, personal experience, it, it's difficult to ensure that the, the data is robust on the registry and that, you know, a significant amount of, of, uh, of surgery is caught on the registry. And so there's, um, in terms of capturing the data, in terms of running the, uh, the database and in terms of who's going to pay for it and store it, are both uh, are all significant challenges. I think further to that, though, is the, the need for increasing the body of research around cord requiner um, syndrome, assessment, management, decision-making, implementation of, of, of tools such as ours and others nationally and internationally. Um, I think that also helps, helps us having links with the likes of Mr. Leach and, and the surgeons who, who have been extremely supportive with us. I think building up a network of, of research active clinicians, physiotherapists, others, um, including and, and surgeons together with clinicians um, is really key in, in moving that forwards. Could I just put the ambassador happy for actually um, our network to use the platform that they have so we can actually use the British Spine Registry to input data if that's what we are thinking is going to be a useful thing to do. Um, you know, that's something they were prepared to build for us. Uh, just just to follow up on, on that, uh, uh, Cord Aquina now is on the Spinal Injuries uh, database uh, and they've done quite a lot of work on that to transfer the information over from the British Spinal Re Registry. Uh, I know the lead of that and I know Dave Cummings has been working quite a, quite a lot on it during COVID and it's been found to be really, really useful uh, to give real-time data. Uh, and I think it's probably the way we're going to go with, with the registries, uh, but that's work in progress. That's great. So there's a lot going on in secondary care, but primary care, suspected cord syndromes syndrome is a, a work in progress, then, then I guess is the message out, out there for those, those ones, isn't it? Um, okay. Uh, lastly, well, I, I, I'm... I'm not sure lastly, but but I wanted to we wanted to get it done within um the hour. Um and I'm coming to you now, Jim, as the, the person from the network who's had um a fair amount to do with commissioners of, of recent times. Um there's there's a couple of questions about getting GPs on board um with this framework and with, with the National Back Pain Pathway as 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 a whole, really. Um do you have any advice as far as that's concerned? The um, I, I looked at this question. It's really it's really cuts to the nub of the whole thing, doesn't it? In that the 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 consensus document that we developed, e even even that consensus process isn't just about gaining clinical opinion from disparate groups. It's about building goodwill and exposure for the pathway. So it starts even before you've developed the document, and then then you've got this laborious task of having things, sheets of paper essentially, and what you want is implementation. So it's one thing to know that the piece of paper exists and that the guidance represents what we feel is the best practice for these patients at risk of or having cord requina. But then you're asking people in a moment of crisis to change their behavior in accordance with that. Uh, and that's GPs and uh, triage and treat practitioners. It's a, it's a huge ask and really, it comes back a little bit to what you were talking about before. A registry and data is one tool for changing clinician behavior. Uh, you can also take a sort of cluster approach in terms of you just keep publishing the guidance you need some targeted events like we were planning at Brit Spine before COVID sort of decimated that. The, the, the webinars that we've done are really, really good. And it's just about people that are in this room now keep disseminating the information 
and creating enthusiasm and compassion and clinical excellence around around the topic and oh god sorry dogs made a appearance um and if and it, and it, and, it, and it will be it will without a doubt my experience of all of these things is that it's a war of attrition really you'll have some quick wins you'll have some slow burners but you just keep going and this is the way clinical skill evolves over a period of time really I, I, just publishing it and putting it in a folder won't change things one iota so yes engagement of everyone consistently over time and we'll get there let's hope so um that's great thanks that's pretty much already the, the, what i'll michelle, do is i'll go to sorry, sorry i just come in there michelle uh, just on that um the specifically on the gp engagement uh, myself and chris are, are speaking at the uh primary care rheumatology musculoskeletal and medicine uh, conference this week uh, so hopefully we'll get some GP uh, outreach there uh, as well as that the GPs tend to use the nice uh, clinical knowledge summaries uh, on their EMIS and uh, system one and I know uh, we had uh, Dr Jerry Morrow uh, involved uh, so I think once we are finalized uh, we can then move on hopefully update that uh, uh, clinical ne uh, knowledge summary the other thing as well, Michelle, is that it's again important to use the regional spinal network. So we've done the dissemination uh, through the webinar and that has been really, really successful. But what we need to do is target other professional groups as well. So um, our regional spinal network, for example, are having um, uh, webinars targeting more at the local clinicians to really disseminate this framework further down the pathway um, because um, so far we've attracted those that are interested, but we need to also be able to disseminate to the people who might not know that they're interested and, and, um, and try and get that down to local level. Fab, that's brilliant. Thank you, everyone. So it's, so it's a let's get the message out and, and it's everybody in this room's job, I guess, is the, the take on from that to try and, and, and get the message out there. Um, so, Carol, I think we'll, we'll come to you, but we'll go to primary care first. Um, there's a few people asked about patients that get sent to the emergency department um, and as the clinician feels that they need imaging and then they get sent away um, without any spinal imaging with a diagnosis of potentially a urine infection or, or, or something else. Um, what do we as primary care clinicians need to do about that? I think we need to, um, I mean, part of it is making sure that you fulfil your duty of care to the patient. So part, the first part of your duty of care is to get them to a and &E, um, or in front of someone who can make the decision about scanning. But if that patient then comes back to you, then you still have that duty of care. So I think it's about how we uh, fulfil that duty of care. So for me, if you are, if you continue to be concerned about that patient and feel they have cord requiner then it's your responsibility to go back to the A&E whether it's orthopedic consult, um, registrar or consultant or A&E uh, staff to have a discussion with them about you know their reasoning and your reasoning to try and push that through um, I think that's sometimes that's helpful uh, and you can have that clinical discussion um, and get the patient in and scanned sometimes that isn't that helpful uh, and and in, in that case, I think you have to be pragmatic and and then try and get the patient uh, uh, an urgent scan through other means. And that might be through your normal pathways as opposed to an emergency scan uh, and accept that, um, you know, that's the best you can do in that situation. And I think that's a kind of pragmatic uh, uh, approach to it. And that's probably what we would do locally. I don't, I don't know what Sue and Laura would, would say. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I would agree, Chris. I think, um, you know, basically what we have to remember is that these patients have come to us with back and leg pain. They haven't come to us with cord equina, but we, we've got a suspicion that, that that might be going on. So we t send them to A&E to really to exclude that or to, to work that out. And if, if they've gone to A&E and, and they're bounced out of A&E, we kind of have to trust that, that, that a little bit to say, well, you know, the opinion of, of 
of them is that you know they they have ruled that out so, and they but they still might be in difficulty so i would probably if i if i you know if i really was really 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 concerned i would bounce them back but otherwise i would be looking to do an urgent scan but also you know our duty is to to treat these patients just because we send them into a and e doesn't mean that's one less patient to worry about you know they're still they, you know they've come to us for their leg and back pain and that still needs treating that's great thanks there's a few people on this to leech that have, have said should they be i know we don't have refer a patient but i guess that's a platform similar to our our patient pass there's a few people said should they then contact you directly via refer a patient or patient pass or whatever it is mr leach having knowing that you have 30 odd on your last on call day do you want to answer that yeah, I think we're trying to move away from people trying to contact the on-call spinal surgeons with for a patient with suspected cauda equina for a number of reasons. I mean, when I'm on call for Greater Manchester, I'm covering three and a half million people. So I really only want to hear about people whose pathology is confirmed. That's just a something we have to, to ration access, really. So we are, there's a lot of work through the regional networks and through GERFT and this program to make sure that the patients get access to MRI because actually the patient you're worried about needs a scan, they don't need a surgeon. They only need the surgeon after the scan's positive. And if you're doing the right number of scans, 90% are negative. So hopefully we're setting up pathways where you don't need to spend half an hour trying to get hold of a spinal registrar on call who is just going to tell you to send them to a &E and get a scan, please. I think the uh, concern about patients who are turned away from a &E is something that we need to sort out at pathway level as well. There needs to be a pathway for what happens to those patients. And, um, and I think an urgent scan will work in many cases, but you will also get patients that you're quite concerned about. And actually, um, it's important in your network that you've got someone that you can escalate that to. As John says, it's probably not to the on-call spinal surgeon, but there's often a more experienced spinal clinician that you can discuss the case with. And for primary care colleagues, one of the things when you work in secondary care is you can look up the computer and see exactly what happened in A&E. You can you know, have a look at previous scans that the patient might have had and get an idea for the size of the canal and things like that. And in primary care, you don't have access to all of that. So it's really helpful if you are worried, even if it's for professional development, that you can actually escalate that to someone that can help explore it and you can learn from it. Um, and I think in some areas they're finding high volumes of patients are turned away from a &E without a scan, in which case audit it and actually use audit results to show whether it's a problem or not a problem, because it's maybe your assessment skills that need developing rather than the behavior of A&E. And equally, it might be that the management at A&E is a problem, and that can be identified through audit of uh, delayed management and missed cases. That's great. And I know that Carol's going to throw that back on us very much, that our chemist saying stop sending people to A&E. So uh, that, um, obviously that message will be loud and clear. Can I say something more about negative scans, Michelle, maybe for the audience? Because um, I do want to impress upon people, if you send someone into A&E for a scan and the scan's negative, okay, that is absolutely not a failure, that that's a good thing to do because there's lots of evidence, as I said earlier, that 90% of the scans are negative. So I, I don't want people, you won't see that many, hopefully, with suspected cauda equina syndrome, but if you sent a few in and the scans are negative, you're doing the right thing. You know, the next one might be positive. So don't let negative scans change your appropriate referrals. The other thing with negative scans is that they've often still got positive findings on them. It's just that they're not cauda equina syndrome and, you know, they're not for emergency management, but they've often got pathology that, that may actually still be needing management and, that's why, although it's excluding quadraquina, it's about considering what, what else is usefully showing up that can be helped. Then we go back to the GERFT um, question of, of GPs ordering scans. And actually, what, what does the ED FY1, who's been on the job for a week, tell that patient that that scan's shown? Um, so that, yeah. 
Jim, did you have something you wanted to add? Not about scans. I think we've covered it brilliantly. But the um, just the sensory testing, the thing that I always try and bring to the fore when I'm doing this, which is helpful to me, and it, I don't know if it will be helpful to the other people watching this. I'm sure everybody else here thinks along similar lines, is that it's just the notion of sensory testing being a reasonably soft uh, form of neurological examination and and the notion of the patient as a sensory witness. So investing a bit of time in explaining what you're going to do and allowing them to make a logical connection between why they turned up with back and leg pain and you're suddenly doing pinprick sensation around their buttocks and the, and the implication of that, and then teaching them the test, which is what we should do with sensory testing generally, but because we're often doing it in the periphery and limbs, we sometimes forget and we just quick, top, 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 everything seems okay. The scan's given us the answer or clinical reasoning generally has given us the answer. This is difficult and everyone's heart rate will be elevated. Concerns will be raised quite reasonably. So explaining the test, making sure the patient is entirely comfortable with you or someone else if they prefer a chaperone and then teaching them what the test is like, teaching them what normal sensation is like, and then working from an area of neurological deficit to normal sensation, it, is, it just helps get a little bit more out of the test. And it'll, thinking in that way with the patient as a sensory witness will probably slow you down and, and lead away from just binary decision-making around intact, not intact, and suddenly making a rash decision. Thanks, Jim. Has, has anybody got anything else that we've not covered or we did cover that, that they think is pertinent to bring up for the recording? Because um, I'm sort so of remembering the, the other. The other thing that I think we really should finish the recording on is about Michelle Golden's um, advice to document, 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 and document. Okay, um, so as part of the Code Requirement Syndrome um, webinar, there were quite a few questions that came through um, regarding the emergency department and access and um, other, other questions regarding the emergency department with patient, for patients from primary care with Code Requirement Syndrome. So I'm really pleased um, we have the Vice President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine um, and a consultant in emergency medicine with us today, uh, Carol Gavin who is hopefully going to answer some of our questions as far as the ED is concerned. Thank you for joining us, Carol. Thank you. Uh, is it, to begin with, is it, are you able to give us a bit of an insight as to um, how things are in the emergency department at the minute with everything that's going on? Yes, well, we've known for a long time that emergency departments are, are very overcrowded and lots of research has shown that that's a risk to patients. So it's something that the college has been working on for quite a long time to reduce overcrowding. And obviously we're now in winter with the winter pressures and the additional um, problems that that often causes. We've now got the additional burden of COVID, which unfortunately um, we're now in the second wave, which has hit the Northwest, especially a lot harder than the first wave. So we find that our departments are increasingly overcrowded. And whereas before we had patients in the corridor, which wasn't good for them, we've now got the additional need to ensure social distancing to keep those patients safe, um, but also to keep our staff safe. So this is probably the most important uh, concern that we're trying to address at the moment. So it's more important than ever, I think, that um, alternative pathways are in place so that patients who don't need um, the core services of the emergency department, which is the treatment, resuscitation and assessment of acute serious illness and injury, to have an alternative pathway so they can see the right person in the right place, which usually will not be ED, um, at the right time. That's great, thank you. Um, so obviously busy at the best of times, but 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 the strain is even greater now. Um, there's a few questions that came in regarding patients that are seen in primary care where the clinician suspects that they may have quadriquina syndrome, 
um, sends them to the emergency department and they, they get sent away with that, without any imaging. Um, what, what are your thoughts as far as that's concerned? Well, obviously, any patient that arrives to the ED will we'll do an assessment. And I think it's important to recognise that that assessment may be um, by a senior person, such as a consultant, or it may be by a very junior person, in some cases, a foundation year two doctor who may have only had um, a year's very limited experience. So, so the actual skills and experience of the person who's seen that patient may, may be very varied. Um, we would hope that the patient would get um, a thorough assessment. And obviously, if there were any red flags for cord requiner, then that should be appropriately acted on. Um, however, many patients who come once they've had that assessment, it may be deemed that they don't have those red flags. So we would then discharge the patient, which of course doesn't mean that um, they don't need any further follow-up or any further assessment or maybe imaging at a later date. It just means that they don't fit our criteria of acute serious illness and injury, which would require our ongoing management. That's great. And I think that fits with Chris's message that, that actually it's really important to follow these patients up when they get back to primary care and, and ensure they've, they've got the right treatment. Um, yeah. So a few people have talked to us about um, sending patients to the emergency department when they're, they're suspecting cord requirement. And given what you've said about the pressures in the emergency department at the minute, do you feel that that pathway is the, in the best interest of the patient? Well, no, I don't. And it's not really a pathway. It's more of a default um, action. And unfortunately, we do find that the emergency department is often the default pathway where other more robust pathways don't exist. So we would definitely encourage people to work with their EDs, work with their local radiology departments to have robust pathways in place. So while with that agreement, the patient may come via the physical emergency department. They shouldn't need to see any of the emergency department clinicians who, as I've said, do need to concentrate now more than ever on our core business of the treatment of very seriously unwell um, patients, not just with COVID, but with other uh, medical emergencies and trauma. And on from that, I think I, I know what you might say to this one. There's um, a few people talked about with virtual working at the minute. Um, if uh, your thoughts on, on uh, potentially very senior physiotherapists assessing patients out in primary care via phone and then advising the patient to go to the emergency department rather than um, performing a clinical assessment. Yeah, I, I would say that that practice is absolutely not in the best interests of the patient um, for several reasons. Um, firstly, you're asking a patient to come to an unsafe environment in terms of infection control. They might, might be asked to sit in the waiting room with a lot of other patients who may or may not have COVID because they're undifferentiated patients. We have no way of knowing that. Um, because of the pressures and the significant um, acuity of the patients we're seeing at the moment, they have, may have a very long wait. Um, so they may be waiting for hours and hours, which if they've got cord equina, then obviously that isn't the right, um, the right thing for them to be doing because that may affect their prognosis. Um, when the patient is seen, as we've said, they may not be seen by a senior person, they may not be seen by somebody who has as much experience as the clinician in the community, who would have been able to do perhaps a much more um, detailed and specific assessment than a, a very junior ED doctor. And then, of course, if there aren't any agreed pathways in place regarding imaging and referral onwards, there may be further delays that might be detrimental in trying to arrange that. So I would say absolutely do not send a page or advise a patient to come to the ED without an initial assessment, because it may be that they don't actually need anything that the ED can offer. They may need direct spinal referrals. So having those pathways in place will, as I've said, allow the patient to be seen by the right person uh, in the right place and most importantly at the right time for them.
So I think there's a few places that, that don't have access to, to spinal surgeons that use their local orthopaedic service as yeah. their referral. The, the appropriate referral um, specialty, yeah. Yeah. Um, so some places obviously don't have, have their pathways set up and we absolutely advocate they go and look at the pathways. Um, but if they, they don't and they have a patient that they suspect has got quadriquinus syndrome with, with retention um, and they have examined them and advised them to come to the emergency department, how would you like them to communicate with you? There's a, a few people said um, sending the patient a text with some information on is, or, or not speaking to you and just saying, go to A&E. What, what, what's the best for if you're the consultant in charge um, when this patient arrives? Well, I think we need to have clear documentation of, um, first of all, what the presenting complaint is, um, what the examination findings have been, um, and what the concerns are that have led for the patient to be um, advised to attend the emergency department, and also that the contact number of the person that's assessed them or that's asked for them to come, so that if we've got any additional questions or there's any um, need to discuss an onward plan then we know the right person to contact and that includes out of hours because obviously we work 24 7 uh, seven days a week so we need to be able to contact somebody to to know what's going on even if the patient um, attends out of hours or at least have a very clear um, written plan to to guide us and the message that's given to the patient, some the, there's some people said that they, they're sending to A&E for a scan. What, what are your thoughts on that message and what the patient hears when they're told that? Yeah, I think that that um, should absolutely not be happening. The emergency department isn't an imaging service. That's the radiology department. Um, as I say, our specialty is to look after seriously ill and injured patients and obviously quadriquinus syndrome is an emergency we recognize that but um we once that has been raised as a possibility by an appropriate clinician um as in the case of an advanced physio um, from a clinical point of view i can't really add anything to that what the patient needs is an urgent scan and then referral to a specialty that can actually act on the results of that scan. So we don't need to get involved. We're not adding to the patient journey. So I think the pathways should exist whereby the advanced physio can arrange for that scan to be performed. As I've said, it may be appropriate according to local policy where the patient waits for the result of that, that may be the ED, but then once the results are available, they should review that and then refer to the appropriate specialty. Fab. So Dermot, who's the chair of the National Back Pain Clinical Network, is going to um, round everything up for us and hopefully um, ju just talk us through and, and summarise everything that, that's been said. Okay. Uh, thanks, Emilia. Th thanks for all, all your help. Um, I, I, I think this whole process has just highlighted the importance of collaborative working. Uh, I have a long list of people who've been involved in this. Uh, and I was going to start reading it, but it's a four A4 sheet. Uh, we have had lots of people involved, and at this, this uh, draft, as Elaine will tell you, uh, I, I think it's probably had 25, 30 different uh, drafts over the years. And I know when this process uh, started at Brit Spine a few years ago, uh, it, it, it was really, really a, a big thing to, to take on. And, and I, I do think uh, as a group, uh, we've done really well to do this. Um, obviously, it's now beyond to ourselves uh, as clinicians uh, to put this framework into practice. I think, as I said on the night, this is a, uh, a starting point. It's a platform uh, for each clinician to go back to their area uh, to create those relationships uh, with the local clinicians so they know what to do uh, on that Friday afternoon when they think they ha may have a, a cord equina. Uh, it's really important as well. Uh, these are stressful situations uh, and to have support of your colleagues uh, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, that I, I think a problem shared in these situations is, is the way to go. Uh, as far as the, where does the, the, the framework go from here? 
Uh, we will finalize uh, all the suggestions uh, and I hope the questions uh, that have, uh, have been all been answered. Uh, we'll finalize that uh, and then we have some work to do uh, with uh, GERFT, uh, NHS resolution, uh, the nice clinical summaries, uh, NHS improvement, NHS England, uh, and a few other bodies to try and finalize this, such as BAS and uh, the uh, 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 spinal surgeons and neurosurgeons. Uh, there's lots of people involved here to fi finalize this. Uh, and then once, once that's ready, uh, the finalized document will be up uh, on uh, our website. Uh, from there, uh, then it's a case, this is a living document. As new uh, research comes out, I know Michael is talking about the research that's going on, and I know that Sue and Laura do some research at present. Uh, with this uh, framework will change depending on, on the, uh, uh, the new, any new information that, and new science that comes out. Uh, our hope is as well, uh, if we can have a unified document uh, across uh, healthcare, uh, that would be excellent. But obviously that will take time uh, and I know uh, Bass and the neurosurgeons are working on that and they've asked us to contribute as well so I think we're, we're all going to work together on that. Uh, so with that uh, I'd just like to thank uh, John, Chris, Laura, Sue uh, and Carol for their involvement tonight. Uh, for our executive special thanks to Michelle for uh, leading on this uh, Jim uh, and all the work Elaine has done over over the over the years on on this. Um, I think I used that baby metaphor uh, on the night, and this uh, is really like that we've uh, given birth to a baby that we hope will develop and flourish. Um, the like also like to support thank you for the support from Henry, uh, who's uh, in the background there. Uh, he's uh, from UKSSB support. Uh, without them, we would not have been able to do all this work, and they've been excellent in, in helping us. So thanks a million. Uh, obviously, please get in touch with your regional spinal networks, uh, get in touch with your uh, national back pain, uh, local regional rep who will be able to help you with this. Uh, there's some excellent uh, information out there. Uh, Sue's new video. Uh, please get out there. Uh, let's make a corticoin a, a condition uh, that, that, that is, is something that uh, doesn't scare as many people and that we can make uh, better uh, lives for our patients who, who live and have to uh, endure this condition. So let's make it less common. Uh, thanks a million. All the best now. Great to see you.